Good morning and welcome to our webinar. This is a webinar that we've done in partnership with the uh, County of Santa Clara. Let me go back one slide here. This is a uh, webinar on the introduction to government contracting. This is also in partnership with the SBDC, that's the Small Business Development Center, specifically the Northern California Network. And I'll talk about PTAC and SBDC in a second. Um, we are very happy to have Christina Jones, who is our lead procurement specialist at NorCal PTAC, giving the main presentation. And we're also very, very thankful to have partnered with um, some of the friendly folks over at the Santa Clara County office. We have Cheryl Liu, who's going to be talking a little bit about their program. It's the Director of Procurement. Michael Fogelstrom, who will be, uh, Michael and Catherine are going to be on the, the Q&A panel later. Michael's the Countywide Contracting Policy Analyst. And Catherine uh, Wasserslav, Wasserlaf is the Procurement Manager. Um, so we're going to hear from Cheryl in just a second. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about PTAC. Um, we are a nonprofit program set up to help small businesses achieve success in the government marketplace. We are hosted by the Humboldt State University Sponsored Programs Foundation that's located up in Arcata where that red star is. And last year we helped our clients win more than $314 million, uh, which was more than double than what we did in 2019. So we're making our clients a lot of money. How do we do it? With three basic core services. The first is one-on-one -on -one counseling. So we have a team of procurement specialists from all across the country. Christina Jones is one here. Uh, they can, if you're a client, they can meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, help you with just about any topic related to government contracting that you can think of. Um, so they can meet with you Zoom, video, conference, email. We also have office hours in the Bay Area in normal times. So we're hoping to get that started up in the not too distant future once again. Um, also for our clients, we have the second thing that we, the main thing that we do, which is custom bid matching. This is pretty cool. You work with your procurement specialist, you work out some criteria that, that you are looking to bid on, then you get an email every day in your inbox that has a list of opportunities that's well suited for your business. You can click on them and get started um, with your bid submittals immediately. It helps you stay on top of all these opportunities. And there are a lot of them out there, so that's a good tool as well. That's something that we pay for, but then we offer to our clients for free. Third thing, of course, are resources and trainings like these. So this is a webinar that we're putting on. We put on a lot of webinars. We're doing three this week. Um, and you can take a look at our calendar, norcalptac.org slash calendar. And uh, these are open to anyone to join from anywhere. We, we put them on a whole host of different topics. Uh, we put a lot of research into these. Some of them are recurring, some of them are novel concepts, um, and they all have updates about things that are changing and, and generally useful information about being a small business trying to get in the government marketplace. So uh, if you want to become a client of NorCal PTAC, uh, you have to be in our service area. So you have to be in one of those counties in green there, and you have to put in an application. You have, to, you have to be an established business. You have to put in an application online. So that's our website there, norcalptac.org. Look for the red apply now button on the top. You click on that and get started with our application. Once you submit it to me, I'll assign you to procurement specialist if you're eligible. And just a note that we are only one of 94 PTACs across the country. Uh, there's seven others, seven, uh, six others even in California. So if you're not in this service area, chances are that you're in the service region of another PTAC. We all offer the same basic core services, only slight differences. So uh, don't despair too much. If, you, if you're in this webinar and you wanna join PTAC, there's a lot of great other PTACs. You can find that link there, aptac-us.org slash find a PTAC. All of these links will be active in the PDF that you'll receive later today. So don't worry about trying to scribble that down on your notepad. Uh, and another note that we are recording this session, this recording will be put up on YouTube and the slides will be put up on Google Drive. Those will both be linked on our website on the uh, PTAC resources page there. You can find it. Uh, I'll send you an email. Everyone will get an email, but you can find it by clicking on resources and past webinars. This is also a really cool area to just see all of the webinars that we've posted in the past few years. Um, you can sift through them and see anything that catches your interest. A lot of good topics, a lot of Q&As going on through the years. So take a look there. 
Um, and I think, yeah, I just want to make a quick note about the SBDC who we're partnering with. The Northern California SBDC, um, is the Small Business Development Center, Development Center, they are a nonprofit network made up of 18 centers. And unlike us, they're, they're dedicated to helping small businesses with every aspect of business creation. We just do, uh, we do procurement. They, they do business creation, growth, management, operation, et cetera. Um, so they're the generalists. We're the specialists. Working in, in tandem with both of us is a really great idea. You can find your local SBDC today to start receiving one-on-one -on -one advising and low-cost training. Uh, just to just want to mention that the SBDC in Northern California is one of the biggest networks. They bring in some of the most money of any any of the networks in the country. So if you're in this service area, it's a really good resource. I recommend taking a look. Both SBDC and PTAC have saw fit to put together a list of resources specifically about COVID-19, um, either about programs that have come about through the pandemic or ways to help in the pandemic response. So take a look at those links as well. Each of our websites slash COVID-19 is pretty easy to find. And I do believe it is time to hand things over briefly to Cheryl Liu, who is uh, the Director of Procurement, I believe, right? Is that? And she will be talking a bit about the uh, County of Santa Clara. County of Santa Clara. So we're very happy to be partnering with you guys and take it away. Thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in for today's webinar. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how the Santa Clara County government does business with its vendor community. Santa Clara County is the sixth most populous county in the state, with a population of more than 1.9 million people. The county contains 15 cities, encompassing approximately 1,300 square miles, which have large concentrations of technology companies. Santa Clara County government has an estimated workforce of 20,000 and is the largest employer in this area. The county's fiscal year 2021 budget is about 8.2 billion, 3.7 billion of which is for the purchases of supplies, services, and fixed assets. The mission of the county is to plan for the needs of a dynamic community and provide quality services and promote a healthy, safe and prosperous community for all. The county values ethical conduct reflecting honesty and integrity and strive to uphold the principles of equality, fairness and objectivity. The county organizational structure includes a decentralized mix of more than 35 agencies and departments and the county provides vital services such as park and recreation, road construction and maintenance, public safety and justice, affordable housing, libraries, and recently the disaster services in combat of COVID-19. It also operates enterprise programs which charge fees to users for services. And two examples of those are the county health system, and the county airports. The county also acts as an agent of the state in administering health, social services, and criminal justice program that are of statewide concern. Um, next slide, please. The county uses a hybrid approach to contracting, uh, which means the procurement of goods and related services, as well as non-professional services they are uh, handled in a centralized manner through my office, uh, the procurement office. Um, the procurement department manages about 870 contracts with a term value of 2.8 billion. Um, four of the contracting teams within procurement are dedicated to centralized contracting effort. Uh, that includes medical patient care contracting team, healthcare support and special project team, facilities, office and institutional operations team, and the technology solutions team. On the decentralized side, the procurement of uh, professional services and the public works is handled by individual agencies and departments. 
there are about 2,300 contracts with a portfolio value of 2.3 billion that falls under this category. Examples of professional services include um, such as licensed professional services, the trainer services, uh, medical services, legal services, um, in the construction area, the architect, engineering, project management services, and also human services and consulting services in areas of uh, management and strategy, information technology, um, operations and auditing. Uh, next slide, please. The county provides an open and competitive process for the vendor community like you to earn our business. Our default method of purchase is to secure competitive bids or proposals whenever possible. We use various types of competitive solicitations to either establish term contracts or issue individual purchase orders. The commonly used solicitation methods are listed on this slide. The award for a request for quotation or invitation to bid process is made to the lowest responsible and responsive bidders. Informal competitive procurement or request for proposal method is used when the county is looking for a best value solution, not the lowest price to bid. They are used when factors besides price are important enough to require evaluation. In addition to price, Examples of criteria which may be considered are the quality of the solution, the quality of the proposed implementation, vendor's past performance, and vendor's qualifications, and corporate strengths and experience. Occasionally, the county does use requests for statement of qualifications to pre-qualify service provider for a given period of time. When we use RFSQ, a second level of competition is typically performed and to select the vendor for a specific scope of work. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide um, is basically showing our commitment. Uh, our office is committed to supporting the success of our client department. And most important thing, uh, it's also to ensure fairness and equal access to business opportunities in the county. We are promoting competition and expanding the use of procurement best practices. And also we are committed to developing high quality and best value contracts to meet our community's needs. Uh, with that, I'll turn this back to James. Thanks so much, Cheryl. It's great to learn about that. Um, I am about to hand things over to Christina Jones here. I wanna make a couple housekeeping notes first. Um, during the presentation, you guys are probably likely to have all sorts of great questions. Uh, we're excited to hear them. Please enter them into the Q&A as soon as they pop into your head. So for some clarification, there is a chat feature and then there's a Q&A feature in this version of Zoom webinar. Uh, the chat is great if you wanna say hi, thanks, if you have a technical issue, something like that. Um, but if you want your question read aloud during the Q&A, which is what I'll be doing and directing it towards our panelists, please enter that into the Q&A. Um, that way we can all track along. So if you do enter a question into a chat, um, I will kindly ask you to copy and paste it over the Q&A. So um, I'm not able to enter questions of the Q&A myself. So um, with that, uh, one more reminder that we are recording this, the slides, the video will all be sent to everybody. So don't worry, you're all getting the slides, the video later today. And um, Christina Jones, here is our Senior Lead Procurement Specialist, NorCal PTAC. You're in great hands with her, so I will hand things over. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, James and Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today, again, I'm gonna be speaking on introduction, an introduction to government contracting, and also a focus, as we just heard, on uh, the County of Santa Clara. So just to get things started, um, a disclosure that the information that I'm providing here today is accurate to the best of my knowledge um, as of today. Things constantly change. So that's just, um, just a disclosure and a reminder. Okay, so what we're going to speak on today is, again, what is uh, government contracting? 
and just learning more about whether or not your business is ready, you know, asking yourself those questions if you've not entered government contracting or if you need, if you have entered government contracting but you haven't been successful, perhaps some things you wanna revisit when you're uh, considering whether or not your business is ready. We'll talk about the certification process um, for government and finding opportunities and how to get started. Um, opportunities and requirements of Santa Clara County. So we'll get into after we kind of cover general state and um, federal contracting, we'll get back into more of the specifics of Santa Clara County. And then we'll uh, conduct a recap and then have some a Q&A. So government contracting is a purchase of products and, and services ranging from pencils and toilet paper, like it mentions here, everything. Um, it can include just about anything. Just imagine that each agency sort of operates as its own um, business and they have needs. They have the need, like it mentions here, for toilet paper for you know, their restrooms. They have a need for pencils, for office supplies. They also have the needs, depending on the agency, for um, sophisticated items in uh, architect and engineering or um, in defense, they have certain needs for a different requirement. So just think that anything, uh, most anything can be per per purchased from the government, but whether or not it's purchased frequently is something we like to, to visit, or if it's uh, a one-off, it may not be a fit as far as your initial target to the government agencies. So there are three levels. There's gov government, local, state, and federal. Um, and that's a really broad category. There's so many agencies that fall with the under local, um, you know, Santa uh, Clara County is one. Um, and state is the federal, there are agencies that are also um, falling under state that are actually, you know, also work in the local space. And then there's federal government. So federal opportunities and something that's not directly mentioned on this slide are public utilities, which is kind of like quasi government so though they also oper operate very similar to the local, state, and federal. And so, as I mentioned, each one has their own way of doing business. And it's our job, if we want to do business with um, the agencies, to learn what is most um, effective for uh, what, how they like to do business. So um, every, it's not a one size fit all. So if you're interested in doing business with the County of Santa Clara, for instance, you need to learn the requirements of how um, the county requires things to be submitted, um, how to follow up with them, how to find opportunities. And we'll talk a bit about that later in the slides. So the main types of contracts are prime and subs. So of course, if you um, can be a prime contractor, great. But a lot of times when companies are starting out, even if they have some experience outside of um, you know, commercial work, when they, are, they have some experience in commercial work, they need to start perhaps as a sub when they're doing government contracting sometimes. So, you know, consider that those are both options. One, as a subcontractor, you're also gaining that experience um, to become the prime. So, but both are viable in some cases, for instance, like with commodities, um, you may not need to be, uh, you know, a subcontract is not necessarily needed, um, but just to know that those are the two options generally. So here's a little bit about why you should consider government contracting, adding this to um, you know, one of your sales funnels. So the government is the world's largest buyer of goods and services. And actually um, local governments, as it mentions here, spend a lot more nationwide than the federal government, for instance. So you can see the state spent 10.5 billion, I believe Cheryl, mentioned um, that the county of Sarah, Santa Clara spends somewhere in the $8 billion range. So just to kind of get some, you know, some perspective to how much local um, agencies can spend um, in relation to state and federal governments. So federal governments have, uh, agencies have set aside. So they have contracts that are set aside only for those who are certified in certain categories to um, bid on. So that's one of the um, advantages, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the certification piece. Um, so learning about is your business ready? Um, these are some things that you need to you know, consider. So a lot of times companies are, they're just starting out and they're interested in you know, government contract and they've seen something and they wanna jump right in. But are you an established business? Sometimes they have an idea and they've actually not gone through the step to establish the business. 
So in order to submit any registration, certification, or to, to bid on a contract, you actually need to be an established business. So if you have questions about how to do that, you should always work with our, a local agency like your small business development center or an agency that, you know, that can assist you with that. But in general, just know that your business needs to be established before you can do business um, with any of the government entities. Um, and does your business plan include government contracting? So again, this is part of your, your initial steps when you're working um, with a consultant or a small business development center. Um, they may assist you with establishing your business, also developing your, your business plan. And within that plan, you want to include a section on how you plan to do business with the government. And some of that, what you need in that plan may come from um, as James mentioned, working simultaneously with a PTAC, for example. Um, so the PTAC can um, help you identify what agencies are a good fit for you. And then that, as far as coming up with strategy, that piece of that can be put into the business plan that you draft um, with the Small Business Development Center, for example. Um, think about whether or not you can afford to sell to the government. There is, um, unlike you know, private entity, for instance, if you're doing business with consumers right now, you may you know, provide a service and immediately you get paid as soon as that's done. So with government agencies, there is a process, um, oftentimes a lengthy process to um, establishing your business maybe in their database for um, payroll being paid. And also um, once you're established in there, there may be a waiting period. For instance, the invoice will be paid 45 days from the date that they receive a proper invoice. And uh, the key word there is proper, meaning if there are errors and they have to kick it back to you or anything of that nature, then that clock doesn't start. So consider that, can you wait that long? Can you buy the supplies up front? Um, can you hire the staff up front that's needed to complete the work um, before you consider that you're ready to do business with the government? And so I talked about research. We can definitely help you with market research or you can conduct, conduct it on your own. There are quite a few free sites out there which we'll also cover and there'll be a slide at the end where you can click on if you wanna just conduct your own research and see you know, which agencies are buying what I sell and how often are they buying it. So um, is your company e-commerce uh, capable? Do you have a website? That is something that, um, for instance, if an agency wants to take a look look at you a little further, they may click on the link to your website. So make sure that you have um, a website active and ready. If you're selling a commodity, you know, perhaps have, um, you know, a shopping cart where they can purchase that online. But even if you, of course, you have services, you have a history of what you've done, what you're doing, and it's clear like between that and another document I'm going to talk about later, a marketing piece that you submit to government that those things kind of brand the same. All right, and so let's define your customer. So, you know, the, the market is so big that of course it'll be difficult for you to do business with everyone. So let's define, you know, who are the first, um, you know, the, comp the agency, excuse me, are best to target. And so there may be a couple from each of these different segments. Um, but just for example's sake, let's go through. So the first segment bubble there is federal government. So in federal government, these acronyms you see here on the side, and we'll cover them in more detail as we go through, um, recognize, uh, rep represent, excuse me, the, the certifications they recognize. So for, it, for example, the SBA has something called an 8A certification, which is a small disadvantaged business. Um, typically minority owned business and it has to meet certain requirements, which we'll kind of cover later. But as far as being um, in business, showing profit for the business, but maybe perhaps would benefit from um, being a part of this program. So HubZone is for those firms that are economically, um, are located in areas where there's an economic disadvantage. Um, ADEM are women-owned small business economically, economically disadvantaged women-owned small business is for obviously women-owned businesses and those that have um, um, personal net worth under a certain level can qualify for economically disadvantaged women-owned small business. And then the VA has a certification for service-disabled veteran-owned small business, SDVOSB. 
and also veteran-owned small businesses. And finally, SAM, Systems for Award Management. That is a registration um, and a self-certification. So oftentimes I, I get companies saying, I wanna get certified as a small business with the federal government. And they don't have a, a formal certification process. It's self-certification through the Systems for Award Management. And what that means is that you would check off the box and self-certify and attest to that you are a small business, a minority business, a woman-owned business, all of those things. Um, and then we move on to the state. So the state of California, they have um, small business enterprise certification as well as disabled veteran business enterprise certification. And so those two, they do not have the um, veteran on, you have to be a disabled vet. So those are two options. You couldn't get certified as a woman owned business or a minority owned business. Um, those are not um, certs that the state recognizes. And then the DLP, DLT, excuse me, Department of Transportation, Caltrans has the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Certification. So, and that covers minority and women owned businesses. So that's primarily for transportation projects, but reaches a little further than that. Um, and then for local, check your certification registration requirements individually with cities and counties. So today we're going to focus on um, the County of Santa Clara and what their requirements are. So if you want to do business with them, their requirements may be quite different from other local agencies. So you wanna hone in on the agencies you want to target. So in order to qualify for those certifications I just reviewed, you, there are some basic um, tests that you need to pass in order to move forward with that. So first off, do you hold 51% or more ownership in the company? So all small business certs require that the um, applicant and the applicant is the person who, whom this is based on. So that would be um, you know, a woman or a minority or a veteran, for example, so that they hold 51% or more ownership in that company. But more importantly, or I should say equally as important, is not just um, holding the ownership, but also controlling the business. So that person who's designated as um, the 51% owner also needs to have the final say in business decisions, be um, recognized as a person who is um, responsible for the business, for example, has, again, has a final say, also perhaps manages the employees, but sometimes for a larger business, of course, they're not managing every employee day to day, but they may manage um, those uh, department heads, for example. Um, and hold the necessary licenses. So if there is a, um, you know, um, for instance, a, a construction license from the California State License Board, it's best that they hold the license. So um, you can have, you know, people that work for you that also hold licenses, but you need to basically show that you have expertise in this industry and not that someone may hold a license, you only manage as far as from an administrative perspective. And if that person was to walk away, the business would cease to exist as far as being you know, in whatever industry you're in. So just think of that when you're thinking about whether or not you control the business um, because it's equally as important as owning 51%. And so, and also you need to be small. And that's determined by the North American Industry Classification System Code called the NAICS code um, for the state of California and for federal work, for federal work, excuse me, and the state of California used something called the UNSPSC code. So they also recognize NAICS as a uh, you know, supplementary, but their primary codes that they recognize for the state would be the UNSPSC code. So the benefits are certification that you know, first of all, it allows you access to set aside contracts. So contracts are set aside only for those who are certified in these categories that we reviewed a few slides back. Um, so that also makes you attractive to bigger business. So maybe there's a, you know, a large company that would love to have the contract that's out there set aside um, for only you know, 8A firms. So by forming a partnership with you, they can get access um, to also participate on that work. So that makes you more you know, attractive to a prime contractor. Also just in general, in general, the benefits of doing business with the government at any level is 
they are a reliable customer. They have rules in place um, regarding, you know, what's fair. Um, like for instance, with the, the federal government, there's the federal acquisition regulation. Uh, and the state has the um, California public record. I mean, that's a public record. They have the California public code. And so those rules can, you know, are there to protect you as well as the government, for example. And so they also have rules in place, for example, um, as far as payment, things that wouldn't occur for a, if you were doing business with a private company, there may not be, there may or may not be regulation in place because, you know, they are not bound by the government's regs. Um, and when I, I talked about setting your company apart, what I was referring to there is, again, making you more attractive to primes, um, allowing you to, own, to participate, for instance, as in um, uh, point three contracts that are set aside only for certified firms, and also something called sole source contracts, which basically are non-compete contracts. So the, um, the, the contractor does not have to compete for that work. The work is sole sourced to them under one of these programs that I just mentioned. Um, and then there's also the mentor protege program. And so that's, um, there, and these links here in orange, when you see these throughout the slides will be active. Um, the mentor protege program is um, basically just what it implies. There's a mentor, usually a large business that's going to have a protege, a small business, likely one of these certif certified firms that we talked about that helps them team up and gain more access to contracts that either of them really couldn't get without the other. And also the protege gives the advantage of learning from the big business, um, you know, and access to professionals who've been doing it in different departments at, at the large business scale. So let's specifically talk about federal procurement. Um, near $600 billion in government contracts were issued within the past fiscal year. Um, and the government is required to award 23% of their contracts to small businesses. They've had that in their mandate. Again, the federal acquisition regulation, their, their like government Bible um, requires that they do that. So um, certifications, if you get certifications, one of those advantages that decreases the pool of competition. Again, those contracts are set aside. So imagine, you know, a giant circle and then a, a, pie, a piece of that pie is cut out specifically for someone who's certified in this particular um, area. So if they're certified as a woman owned small business and the contract, the solicitation comes out and under set aside, it states woman owned small business, only those who are not only owned by a woman owned small business, but those who are actually certified as a woman owned small business can compete on that work. Same thing, um, other advantages are sole source opportunities, which I just mentioned, mentor protege, teaming opportunities. So some companies may not, large companies, for instance, or even small businesses uh, may not be interested, may not um, want to actually enter a mentor protege agreement with you a long term, but they may want to team up with you on a particular opportunity. So those are um, some many advantages to federal procurement um, and then increased visibility among government buyers. So um, just by being certified, for instance, if they're looking, if they're running low on those goals, for instance, in bullet two, uh, the 23% that's to be awarded to a small business, and perhaps they're running, you know, behind on maybe their service disabled veteran owned goals, then um, by you being certified as such, they may be looking up firms that are certified as such. And so that increases your visibility because you're actually certified as a service disabled veteran owned small business. And that's what they're, you know, what their search they're conducting is what they're looking for. So the regulation I've been talking about, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the FAR, this is where you can find um, the rule book basically for federal contracting. Um, and, and also when you have a solicitation, when a solicitation is put out, you will often see pages and pages and pages of these FAR regulations. And you should pay attention to them. You should read them. Um, all of them aren't required in order to submit a response to the bid, but they all are required in the fact that if you win, this is what you'll be, 
required to you know, comply with. So you wanna make sure that you read it, you understand it, um, and that you also you know, point out things to just remind yourself, because sometimes companies just skip through this and don't realize something in that uh, FAR clause may be a deal breaker for them wanting to do business on this particular contract. So think of those things when you're reviewing um, uh, your solicitation and you see all of those clauses. You'll also see all of the clauses um, when you complete a SAM registration. So SAM is basically going to have a lot of things that you'll need to attest to, and they'll have these regulations linked in there, um, and which will link back to this site. And there's a couple of other sites also, but this is the primary site where the um, the FAR ruling rulings are listed. So this is just a sampling of some of the things that the federal government buys. Um, there are just so many things that we could, you know, do a whole slideshow and then some on all the things that the government uh, buys. So these are just some high level categories, but, um, and, and high level because there may be things, obviously consulting, for example, what falls under that, almost everything. I mean, there's so much I should say. So there could be something that's commodity based that also has a consulting piece to it. You know, how to use the product, you know, um, uh, consulting on, you know, things that go wrong. So some of these things can work together, but just a high level category list of things that the government purchases. But again, we can help you kind of drill down to what it is that you sell that the government buys and who buys it. So this is a, um, a list of some other procurement mechanisms. So we talked about certifications. Those are ways to do business with the government as far as set aside, sole source contracts, mentor protégés. There's also something called contract vehicles and there are also a whole list of these. Um, and there's all, some of these are actual uh, contract vehicles but there are other ways to do business. For instance, simplified acquisition. So you know purchases that where they don't have to put those out for bid and they can, um, for instance, have a credit card and they do this on the local, state, federal, they all do this, um, where they can you know, slide their credit card and purchase something that they need from you that doesn't have to be put out and formally bid. So think of other ways that you can do business uh, with the agencies. The federal supply schedules, um, those are schedules that like, I like to say like the government's giant, uh, government's uh, yellow book, giant yellow book that you need to be pre-approved to be listed there. Um, and they have that at the federal and the state level, but we're talking about federal right now. Um, so you need to be pre-approved with your pricing. They vet you as a company as far as your um, capabilities and readiness. And then once you're approved, you kind of go on this online, like I say, yellow book as far as, you know, where agencies can find you and purchase your products already at pre-approved pricing. Blanket purchase agreements um, also use widely through different types of agencies and uh, federal state, for example, but basically they can enter in a contract with you where they can purchase as needed under a blanket purchase agreement. Um, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts. Also, they can purchase from you sort of indefinitely under, this, under the contract period and then quantities that they need. So those are just some examples or others, but um, just some examples of other ways that the government can uh, procure from you. So let's move into the federal certifications. We talked about women owned small business a little bit. Um, and this is a relatively new change in this program as of October of 2020. So it used to be a self-certified program. You upload some documents to their portal. And from that point, you could state you were woman owned certified unless until I should say a contract came up opportunity and then the contracting officer will be required to pull those documents and verify what you submitted to confirm you're actually woman on. But recently in October, they revised the program to make it equal with the others as far as requiring third party certification. So that means you need to upload documents, but you also need to have it underwritten by someone at the SBA. So, um, and those requirements are just um, based on, of course, being all of these are based on, besides HUBZone, being 51% owned by that economic category and um, controlled also by that individual. 
So, and the economically disadvantaged woman owned, again, is, perched, is based on um, um, being in a certain um, personal net worth below 750,000. So then there's the 8A program. Uh, that's a business development program. That's what makes it a little different from these others is because it's a set time. It's for nine years, um, one time, one and done. You can't re-enter the program. You can't re-enter with a family member or something like that. It's a one-time opportunity for them to develop your business. Um, you know, so assuming you already have some growth, you have to usually have some type of growth as a business before you're able to enter this program. Um, and then they help you to develop that hopefully to by assisting you with getting 8A contracts, um, sole source, and then hopefully by the time you, you exit in nine years, you'll have a mix of you know, federal and state and local contracts and you graduate from the program. Um, and then HubZone, again, is based on companies that are located in areas that are um, economically depressed as determined by the census. So a HubZone company needs to have 35% of its employees live in a HubZone. And also the company itself needs to um, be located in the hub zone. So those that live in a hub zone, they don't have to live in the hub zone of the company, um, just in a, des a designated hub zone. Service disabled veteran um, or veteran owned small business is offered by the VA um, currently, but it's gonna be moving over to the SBA for third party certification. Um, but basically certifying you again as a service disabled veteran owned company, um, they have a, a program called Veterans First. Um, that puts veterans first for the VA as far as veteran-owned small businesses. So here's the steps for, so any of those certs I mentioned on the last slide, first step is to um, get registered here, Systems for Award Management. So SAM is where you register, um, you need to be registered in order to submit a bid, a bid response for federal government, and also where you need to be registered to be paid. So you do need to make sure this is uh, kept up to date. Um, it's a requirement, not a formality. And um, so part of this process is divine, to define your primary NAICS codes, which this link uh, sends you to the North American Industry Classification System code where you can put in keywords and find the code that best describes what you do. Um, and then you need to obtain a DUNS number. So, and this will, uh, Dun and Bradstreet, um, offers a unique number, which is going to be actually, they're going to be changing it from Dun and Bradstreet to another um, source in the next year or so. But for, for right now, you need to obtain a DUNS number, and the DUNS number is needed prior to registration with SAM. So then you register, and just a reminder to be wary of scammers, particularly with SAM. Um, there are companies that have sites that really look like SAM. I mean, they look almost identical. And so uh, clients click on those and they tell them, you need to pay $600 to get registered. SAM registration is completely free. And if you are actually um, on you know, the SAM site, it will even tell you, contact your local T your PTAC if you need assistance with this. So we are partners with the federal government in um, assisting them with getting you know, clients ready for to do business with the government. And part of that includes helping them um, with SAM registration. So this frees them up from, you know, the repeated calls of, you know, some of the basics on getting registered, um, which we can assist you with um, as a client for free. So once your SAM registration is complete, well, near complete, the second to the last page, there'll be a blue SBA box that pops up. And that's where you click on that and you complete what's called the dynamic small business search. And that is where if a contracting officer is searching for, um, you know, a qualified firm, like I mentioned before, making yourself more visible. Um, so if they're searching for a particular firm, they may go to dynamic small business search. They often do and do market research. How many 8A firms in this particular NAICS code provide this service? Um, is just an example. And so they may pick out three in the local area where they want to work and ask them to submit, you know, information on their capabilities. So the government definitely does um, research from dynamic small business search. So also it's something that 
you want to make sure that you complete along with your SAM registration and we can help uh, walk you through that. So let's move on to state procurement. And here's a little bit about what this, this, the state of California purchases or what they've done uh, through 2018, 2019. 2.2 billion in total contracts to small businesses and 434 million to DVBE firms. So these are some of the agencies that have the top spend, um, Cower Cycle, the emergency. Usually I hadn't seen that on there in the previous years, but with all of the fires and things of that nature, it has you know, moved up um, as far as the spend there. So CDCR, Corrections and Rehab has been there quite a while, so, is, so, has, uh, so has the uh, Department of Water Resource and General Services. So these are the agencies that have the top spend, but that doesn't mean that you know, of all the hundreds of agencies that there may not be another one that has a focus on what you sell. So again, that's what we need to get to the bottom of so we can target the right agencies instead of you know, trying to target everyone. So, and here's how that spend is kind of split. If you can look over to the right-hand side of your screen, um, the largest spend is with services. So, doesn't mean, again, like I say, that some of the others aren't um, a better fit for you and have a good spend for what you're selling. So, here's just a snapshot. Um, the state has this, I love this um, site that they have with it, small business only, top 30 UNSPSC codes. So those are the United Nations product service codes, basically similar to the NAICS, but what um, the codes that the state recognizes. So of these, so it shows the top 30 in small business, the top 30 for DVBE, and those who are dual certified. So just showing you like perhaps you sell printing, you say, oh, well, I can see a small business certification would benefit me. Um, there is quite a bit of spend in that area. So this is just a start again to look at it from a high level, but we could look at it more specifically um, as a client. So their certifications are um, small business, uh, SBE, and you have to have less than $15 million a year in sales that's averaged over three years and, and less than 100 employees. So I've only seen one case over the years where I had a client a janitorial firm that had less than 15 million per year in sales, but had 104 employees and did not qualify. So it's not one or the other, it has to be both. Um, so just consider that if you're you know, on the cusp, you also need to be located, um, have a headquarters in California in order to qualify. And there are some other things that um, are needed, but for the most part, if you are a California firm and you're a very small business, um, a lot of the business I think a good majority are considered micro businesses. And then um, you will go through the process, which is through a portal, upload um, a few documents, will, which will include like your tax returns and verification of your um, tax ID. And um, perhaps if you have employees, a DE9C information about what you filed on your employees, you upload those things. And most of the time, not 100% of the time, but most of the time that certification is instant. So that's one that um, if you qualify for and you would like to do business with the state of California, you should definitely pursue um, because one is because, you know, it's, it's not a lot of work for you to get that done. And two is because um, the state is very active in ensuring that they give their fair share to certified small businesses. So you don't want to miss out on that because you have not um, followed through with the process. Um, small business for the purpose of public works, that's a relatively new certification within, within the past few years. So this is designed for those who are in public works who have, you know, bigger projects. Um, maybe, the, you know, they have construction projects that are huge. So their sales revenue can go up to $36 million per year average, and then less than 200 employees. Disabled veteran business, business enterprise is for those who are disabled vets and have a letter issued by the VA that are on their DD-214 when they were discharged that shows that they have a 10% or more service-connected uh, disability rating. Um, so there's been talk over the years about reducing you know, the 10%, but so, so far it still stands that you have to have at least 10% of a service-connected disability rating. A lot of opportunity there is, as well, because um, if you may recall from a, a few slides back, 
you know, the spin there is a little lower, oftentimes because they cannot find um, certified disabled veteran business firms. So if you're qualifying in that area, um, please consider, you know, going through the process for that certification. That one is not instant. Um, they will underwrite it usually within 30 days, what you upload. Um, but again, it's something that can be very valuable if you are a DVBE. So this is um, about the Caltrans uh, DBE, which sounds so similar to DVBE, but it's the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise certification offered by Caltrans and, uh, and some supporting agencies that also do the uh, certification, uh, um, underwrite this, which would include like BART, you know, um, other transportation agencies also participate this, in this, um, underwriting this process. But it's a primarily uh, Caltrans program. It's actually a federal program. So every state has a disadvantaged uh, business enterprise cert and they have different requirements, but um, it's always required that you get certified in your home state first. So you can get a, um, a reciprocal uh, certification, but it needs to start with your home state. So they ask, um, you know, confirming that you're, for instance, a minority and have a disadvantage. Um, your personal net worth needs to be 1.32 million or less. Um, and that excludes the, the equity in your home, but does not exclude like a 401k if you have it. And um, the other unique thing about this versus um, the other certs I've covered so far is the on-site visit. So because of um, COVID, they have been doing the on-site visits um, virtually. However, you know, when we go back, I'm not sure if they'll go back or up until a year ago, it's always been a visit to your actual office and they review and, and basically trying to confirm what you've put on the application, what documents you've submitted, and they ask, uh, interview you basically. So I just always um, uh, advise clients to not view this as, oh, I'm at the site visit, I'm about done. The site visit is part of the certification process and it's very important. So you don't want something that was done at the site visit to prevent you from getting certified. So just think of it, it's, it's um, a part of the process, underwriting process. The California Public Utilities Commission, which I mentioned is kind of like um, a quasi government. So they also have goals for, um, you know, uh, contracts for minority owned, women owned, uh, service disabled, veteran owned businesses. They also have a certification for LGBT um, um, companies, um, but they do not have currently a goal as far as um, for those entities. But these are, you know, the different entities, and this would be re this particular certification is recognized by utilities. So that would include like PG&E or, you know, um, any of the water and gas companies, Verizon, all of those types of companies um, would recognize this cert. However, some of them have a, a dual recognition like, recognition like for instance, a Verizon may, you know, is a large corporation also. So they may recognize another corporate cert as well as they're part of the utility cert. But um, in general, if you were trying to do business, let's just say with, you know, PG&E, this is a certification that they would recognize for small business. Okay, so we're moving on to local contracting. Again, um, we want to, you know, look at what is the local, um, the local agency asking for. Um, so their requirements may be different than what I've covered so far with state and federal. Um, but also a lot of times local opportunities, especially prior to COVID are, you know, agencies that are closer to you that you can go in and um, be more familiar with. Um, as far as them knowing you. And it's a great way to get your feet wet with contracting, but also not just to get your feet wet. There's a lot of contracting, as you can see, um, at the local level. So maybe local contracting is, you know, where you should be based on the research as far as what they purchase. Um, so something to consider. So they also have many um, counties and cities have a local business enterprise, like a local business preference. So I always ask, you know, one of the things is, you know, what county are you in? And, it, you know, a lot of them I know offhand, but if I don't, I still confirm whether or not they offer an actual preference. Some of them offer a preference, but don't require you to go through like a paperwork process. 
um, and others require you to actually go through the process of registering as a local business enterprise. For instance, like um, Alameda County requires you go through an underwriting pro process to be certified as a local business enterprise. So this link here is really valuable because we've um, listed a lot of the uh, local counties and you can click right here and uh, see their, what, is their, what are their requirements what, for procurement, um, whether or not they have an LBE, those types of things. And it covers quite a few counties, of course, not all, but quite a few that are within our service region. And another option, of course, is you can just Google the county name plus purchasing to come up on the site if you don't uh, see it here on our link. Okay, so to find opportunities, and we're talking about the state and federal and local is gonna vary, but the state, they have uh, Cali Procure has a database where you can search solicitations in your industry and region. Again, there'll be um, a link. There's a link here, but there's also one at the end of our slide presentation. Um, and then you can register for email alerts. You can also do this in, um, at the same time that you get certified as a small business, it'll ask you, do you want to sign up for notifications and move basically the information you put in for certs over to the notification process. So whatever codes you entered that you want to be certified under, those would move over to the notification and notifi notify you if any bids came up. Um, the federal government, beta.sam.gov. So sam.gov is the systems for award management beta.sam.gov replaced a system called uh, Federal Business Opportunities, which they're turning it into, uh, beta.sam.gov Sam .gov will eventually be, you know, the one stop for all of these different um, things. So not only um, systems for award management, it'll be federal opportunities, it'll be Department of Labor information. So it'll be a lot of different things that are combined together when it's out of the beta phase. But currently, you can view some of those things there, but you can't register for SAM, for instance, there. But you can view um, opportunities that are 25000 or more. That's a single point of entry for new solicitations that come out for the federal government. So again, you could sign up for um, email alerts there, but also for the state, federal, and also local, I should say, um, a lot of those will come through our bid match service as well. So if you sign up for services with us, you can um, get access to our free bid match service. And through that, it will you know, send you opportunities when they come up for state, federal, local, you know, small contracts that come up that are small purchases. Um, and some of that will be overlap, but honestly, some of the systems, they just seem to miss something. So a lot of it may not be overlap. So, um, consider, you know, getting signed up for BitMatch if, if you would um, sign up as a PTAC client, but also consider registering here directly. Okay, so now we're moving on to our main focus today, um, local contracting with the County of Santa Clara. So let's talk a little bit about the top spend. I know you um, that Cheryl covered a lot of the things that are purchased by the County of Santa Clara, but I just want to bring up a few other unique items that are purchased at the, um, at the county level, but also some of these things could be purchased with pretty much any agency, federal um, or state agencies also purchase similar type things. But for the County of Santa Clara, some unique items are like goat grazing services, um, pig trapping services, Grooming, um, so grooming like, which includes like hair braiding, um, popcorn, dry ice, physician services. So those are just some of the things that, um, you know, are uh, within, under the categories that we have covered here that the agencies may um, purchase, but it's truly A to Z. And that's with, you know, all of the government agencies. It could be anything from A to Z um, that's purchased. So. Um, consider, you know, if the county of Santa Clara is especially in your, your area, consider, you know, whether or not they buy what you sell. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we kind of um, outlined these a bit by what's being purchased quite a bit currently. So a lot of technology, uh, healthcare equipment and supplies, um, and furniture related items. So a lot of these things are, are pretty on the 
the top of the list of uh, commodities that are being purchased. Same thing with uh, services. So professional services, health and human services, consulting, which covers again uh, so much can fall under consulting. Um, so these are just construction services versus just commodities as materials, uh, education and training and janitorial and custodial. So a lot of these top items, again, fall across a lot of the agencies because these are a lot of things that a lot of agencies do need. Um, and so this is just a sampling I was looking for. This is just a sampling of what um, is being purchased by the County of Santa Clara. So it's so much more. Um, Cheryl covered a lot of it at a, a high, high level categories. I'm covering just a bit of it. But again, just conducting your research, um, we can find out more about exactly what they purchase that's in line with what you sell. So the first step for doing business with the county is to get registered with the county. So their vendor portal, um, they use a couple of them. They use Periscope, which was formerly BidSync. If any of you are familiar with BidSync, um, they use that to advertise their opportunities as well as um, Ariba. So you should register with both of those. Um, and they recognize the commodity codes, which there's a link there to identify your commodity codes to describe what, you, what it is, the commodity you're selling. And then also your UNSPSC code. So you may be familiar with this if you currently do business with the state of California, same code, or just by me, my mentioning it earlier, um, that this is what the state of California, the code that they recognize. So they have complete guides, which are you know really useful to guide you through this process. Um, but if it's still overwhelming with a PTAC, again, can assist you with um, walking you through getting registered or any questions you have um, alongside with um, the county. And step two is to conduct the research. So um, finding out what they buy, the similar or, or to what you sell or what matches what up with what you sell. So what have they purchased in the past? What active contracts do they have that you can glean some information from? So conducting research can be uh, twofold. One is, of course, looking at their active contracts. Um, I'll show you on a, a, the next slide a little bit about forecasting, seeing what potentially is coming up with the county. But also if you work with us, for instance, at, at the local PTAC, uh, we'll conduct research on a, um, a bid service we subscribe to called GovSpin. So it does a really good job of tracking on what, what's been purchased at the county, um, city level, and also like school districts, things that, you know, small items. So we'll look there to see, you know, what has been the history of what's been purchased um, with the county of Santa, Santa Clara in the past year or two. Um, and then we also could search there by competitor names. So if you know of a, a competitor has done work with the county, we may look and you know see what type of work have they done and how similar it is, which kind of leads me to that last point, um, requesting public records. So the county has um, uh, an option to submit your request um, to this email address to request a copy of public, public records. But the first step is identifying which public records you want to request. And that's what that conducting research finding out what contracts you would like to know more information about. Um, and then we can request those two public records. So again, um, what you'll find on these sites, a lot of times is just the high level information. It will include, for instance, the, you know, the contract name, maybe a brief description of what was done and the final award amount. But if you're looking for more detail as far as, you know, uh, what was a full scope of work, um, you know, what, what were the line items under that final award cost? You know, what did they charge for this, uh, this or that? And what did they say again that they would do for that money? That is when you wanna request a copy of, you know, the winning bid and, you know, get more detail. That will help you in putting forward, um, when you respond to a solicitation or approach, you know, a county buyer, arm you with um, intelligence on what it is they're purchasing, how they're purchasing, and what it is, for instance, if you looked at the scope of work and you saw you know, what the um, competitor agreed to do, what it is that you might be able to do better 
um, just in um, thinking about when you're ready to submit your response or how could your pricing be better or you know, making sure your pricing is even in the ballpark. So those are all some benefits of um, requesting public records. So when it comes to learning more about the forecast, um, the county has a, um, a, like a board here where if you were to click on that forecast link, it would lead you over to this page. And um, it's just forecast is not what they're calling it. It's just, I put that there for references because you're trying to determine what are they forecasting to buy. And so on this site, they are, um, you know, there are several different meeting groups. I just chose for the purposes of this example, the planning commission, because that sounds like, yes, yeah, something that, you know, they may be planning, uh, they're gonna build a particular thing and I wanna find out more about what they're gonna build and what I'm selling, how that fits into that. Um, so you can view from that, once you, I clicked on the planning commission, I can view the agenda and the outcomes so, you know, agenda items, you know, of course, are, are standard, whatever they're going to cover. And then the outcomes may say, you know, we plan to do, you know, do ABC or build this or that. So that's kind of giving you, you know, you're gleaning info from what they're planning to do and following along um, with these meetings as they're kind of, you know, putting together um, really, they're really sort of not, not directly, but indirectly creating the opportunities that you want to respond to. So this is something that can benefit you. You look through the different meeting groups. Um, they're all different types here and see what's applicable and attend you know, the live meetings. And also they're posted out here because I did not attend the live meeting, um, but I was able to download you know, the meeting results. And then follow up where appropriate. So if you think that there is an opportunity to you, for you to follow up with the procurement department at the County of Santa Clara or someone particular that has a question, for instance, maybe they addressed during uh, one of these meetings that you can answer, you feel like you have a solution and follow up with that particular person, um, you know, first leading off with, you know, this is where, you know, I attended this board of supervisors meeting and, you know, you spoke about ABC. And I just wanted to provide some insight on, you know, whatever it is, a topic, a little follow-up on your company, um, and perhaps including what they call a capability statement. And that is basically your one-page um, business flyer as the government wants to see it, which will list your past performance, a little background on your company, um, what codes do you generally work under, meaning your UNSPSC codes in, in the case of the county, or, and you may just have one that serves, you know, uh, all of the public sector. So you have a UNSPSC codes, and then you also have your um, NAICS codes, for example. Um, and then, um, you know, providing that with your past performance, of course, your contact information, what you're certified as is beneficial to helping, you know, the county look at a quick snapshot of who you are. So think of, you know, having that prepared and ready when you're ready to, when you're going to follow up with anyone um, based on this, um, what you find here. So step three is a competitive procurement. So say for instance, you've been preparing, you've been following what's um, listed on the previous slide. You've been following on the meeting, the meetings and um, you know, see that something's coming soon and you're ready to bid. So these are just some of the, the different ways that they, um, release their solicitations for competitive bid. First one being a request for quote, which you'll see quite often. I think um, I've seen a few others, but not as many uh, with different agencies, the invitations to bid called an ITB, but um, similar um, to an RFQ. And then also informal competitive procurements. I don't believe there are quite as many of those right now, but I'll let the county chime in on that when they come in for a Q and A. And then of course, requests for a formal proposal. So that's a full response that includes, you know, background, technical, um, how you're gonna technically accomplish what it is you, you say you're going to do, and of course, pricing. So um, those would be, that would be step three. So you're first going to do the research to see who's buying what you sell. And then you're secondly um, going to try to glean some information, uh, excuse me, on first step, you're going to get registered. 
sorry. Second step, you're going to see who's buying what you sell. And third step, you're going to um, respond to their competitive procurement. Um, and so just a note that 5%, there is a 5% local preference for local vendors. So they do offer the LBE. Um, I didn't find a formal program that you have to um, submit and get approved like you do with like a different uh, other county sometime, but there is a local preference um, for those who are in the local area. So just to recap, and this just really applies to um, all different public sector, get registered as a vendor with all entities with whom you might wanna do business with. Um, so typically this comes um, after some general research, um, unless you say, for instance, I'm located um, in the County of Santa Clara and I really wanna make them as a local vendor, I wanna make them my target. I definitely wanna just right off the bat, get registered with them. Um, get certified if eligible, but only if relevant or useful. Um, and so for most, most cases, getting certified is beneficial because if you don't get certified and something comes up, for instance, at the federal level and you could have been certified, it will be too late um, to qualify for that set aside by the time you decide, oh, well, there's an opportunity out here because certifications are typically gonna take about 90 days for completion. So just consider um, getting certified where you can. Um, one that I think even if you are eligible, but you may want to wait and consider would be like 8A certification at the federal level. Because that is a business development program and there's a one-time entry, you don't wanna just get certified if you're not able to focus on growing within that program because sometimes companies get certified and then it's not until five years in that they decide to do something and they realize the value of the program and then they only have four more years and um, you know, that's it, they can't redo it. So, um, but like getting certified as a small business, uh, getting registered with Santa Clara County, those types of things you should definitely do upfront. Do your research and this is gonna be ongoing, not just when you uh, initially start off, but just ongoing researching who your competitors are, what the agencies are buying, you know, things that may have changed for instance, because of last year, um, with the pandemic and uh, the ongoing pandemic, what is the agency buying right now that you could sell? Um, and building relationships with the agencies. So don't be afraid to start small with city, county, state, or subcontracting, especially if you can get on a subcontract to boost your past performance record is great. And again, we're here at the PTAC to assist you. So we have free assistance if you're in our local area or also you can um, find your local PTAC nationwide by just going to, um, I think the site's on the next page, it's like aptac.us or something like that. But that's the association of PTACs. And this is a slide I think is really helpful because I know it's a lot of information that we've both imparted and in a short period of time. But these are some research sites. Most of these I covered, if not all during our session, um, but this is, um, just how you can get right to it. Like for instance, I didn't actually cover like how the federal money is spent, where to get to that site. So that's a link directly to USA Spending. Those are free sites where you can conduct your own research. Um, and the same thing over in, um, you know, looking at how to get certified, the second block. So different ways to get certified, what's required, um, you know, finding qualified vendors, all of these different um, links are really important to the procurement process at the federal, state, and also at the county level. So over on the, on the final column, I have how to register as a vendor with Periscope and as a vendor with Ariba. Um, and those are links directly to the county site as far as how um, the vendor guides that, um, well, actually the vendor guides are next. But the other, the first one is just how to do business with the county of Santa Clara. Signing up for newsletters, identifying your commodity code. So there's a, um, a lot of information here that you can use well after this uh, webinar. And I think for that, I'll turn it back over to James. Awesome, Christina, that was really great. Thank you for all your work put into this. Uh, we have tons of great questions in the Q&A, so we're gonna get to that quickly. I just wanna mention a couple upcoming events. I'm not really gonna go into them, um, but just take a look at our calendar. Most of our events uh, start at 10 a.m. We've got a marketing strategy for California small business, disabled veteran business enterprise certified businesses. 
um, more service disabled veteran owned small business certification on Thursday, March 18th. And then we've got an interesting one we're partnering with a law firm about uh, Biden's new directions for government contracting. So um, there's uh, more topics in this series coming up. So do take a look at our website, norcalptech.org slash calendar. A lot of other goodies there as well. And now I think we have time for the Q&A. We have a bunch of questions already, but if you do have a question, make sure to enter it into the Q&A window. If you enter a question into the chat, um, I'm gonna ask you to put it over to the Q&A just so we can consolidate, keep all on the same page and we can all track our questions. Um, and in case we get any questions, uh, once again, I, thought I can't say this enough, everyone will get the slides and the video recording of what we're doing right now. So rest assured this Q&A itself will be given to you later today for, to review, so. If that's uh, stressful trying to take all the notes, don't worry about it, just sit back and enjoy. All right, so if we could have all our panelists turn on their videos, get ready for a Q&A here. Um, uh, so like I said, any of you are um, available to take any of the questions that we have, um, unless they're of course specifically sent to one of our panelists. So the first one comes from Mark Walsh, who is asking, would you please tell us which system you use to promote your open contracts? Do you use Cal eProcure or something else? I uh, so I think this could be for uh, for one of the Santa Clara County folks. Um, this, so is this is Cheryl. Oh. Um, Go ahead. I provided a response to Mark earlier this morning and the County of Santa Clara uses both Ariba and Periscope for all of its solicitations. And there's a link directly provided here and there will be another shared in the slide deck as well. Perfect. And just to, thanks, thanks Catherine. And just to know, I'm, I'm going to read the questions. Uh, even if sometimes people ask a question, then it's answered later in the webinar. I find that reviewing information is good. Um, so thanks for answering that via texting earlier typing um jai sharma is asking are there specific opportunities set aside for small micro businesses operating in the technology related consulting services i mean the answer is yes but i believe he may be asking from the perspective of county of santa clara but i i know for sure as um just you know public sector wide yes and um. This is Cheryl, I'll respond to that question. So we currently don't have a set aside for that specific category, um, but our office is in the process of piloting a food sourcing program. Uh, it's set aside for small businesses located in Santa Clara County that include minority owned, women owned and veteran owned. So the program is we are committing to reserve 250,000 for food as spot by purchases uh, from those business for those business to compete. And our intent is to maximize the food spending locally as much as possible. And also um, to, to really encourage our minority women and veteran owned businesses to bid on those projects. Can I just add that um... Not specifically as far as other types of government for micro businesses. I just want to clarify for small businesses, there are set asides, not for micro business per se. That's correct. Thanks for that clarification, Christina. All right. Thank you, Cheryl and Christina. An anonymous attendee is asking, we are a small business by size and revenue, but not qualified for 8A. Are we included in the set aside program? Do we need to be formally certified as a business or is it self-certified? Um, so if you're not qualified for 8A, I mean, there may be others you can qualify for um, depending on what your category is. So small business itself with the federal government does not have a certification process. It's self-certification through SAM, Systems for Award Management. Um, for the state of California, they do have a small business certification, so you can qualify as a small business with the state. And um, I'm trying to see here you include it. So for the federal government, there are set asides for small business. So there aren't set asides at the state, but they do have preference. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sajid is asking, the mentor protege program is run by which department? Is it the SBA? Yes. Mentor protege is run by SBA. 
nice and quick. Mark again asking, where can we find the California public code? Um, you can actually just Google it like that. It should come up. I don't have a direct link. I, I'm not sure in the links I provided, but you should be able to Google it. It'll, it'll come up. If not, uh, James will provide a, a link. Um, I just want to add it uh, on our county website. Um, if you go to sccprc.org, uh, under policy category, there is a link to federal uh, code as well as the California public code. Huh. Great. Perfect. All right, good question, Mark. Uh, Mark again is wondering, Periscope requires a fee to search their database. Do you recommend that we subscribe to find for Santa Clara opportunities? Um, he's saying that they do have a free service, but it's very minute. So to register, um, to view and participate in any of County of Santa Clara issued solicitations, there is no fee. Um, so Periscope and Ariba both offer additional services to vendors, but those are outside of the scope for what the county uses it for. So if you're interested in anything that's issued by County of Santa Clara, you have full access with the free account. So there is no need to pay for a subscription or upgrade the type of account that you have. Okay, thank you, good answer. We have a question here. How do we connect with a mentor on the Mentor Protege Program? Um, the SBA doesn't get involved in um, matching for mentors. So really you have to do it as far as you know networking, um, there are some, you know, private companies that do some matching, you know, you'd have to vet those, but you'd have to go about it traditional way events, finding someone um, that you believe that would be a good match for you as a mentor. Thanks for that question. Uh, Ellen is asking, I'm a certified SBE and SWBE for the state of California. How do I register for a federal, federal supply schedule and how do I get involved in the Mentor Protege Program? Um, the federal supply schedule, we can assist you here at the PTAC with um, determining whether you qualify. They also have, you know, quite a few um, qualification factors that we need to consider, you know, length of time in business, you know, amount of sales, for example. Um, so we can, you know, discuss that if you become a client on whether or not you qualify, that's all individual. And then getting involved in a mentor protege program, there is... Um, a link, the SBA, if you search SBA Mentor Protege Program, it'll bring up the basics on what you need to do as far as to get um, approved as a Mentor Protege Program, a Mentor Protege. Um, but as far as finding a mentor, you, you kind of have to do that piece on your own. And then you go to the SBA site and complete the paperwork and then they approve um, your agreement. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Ani is asking, what would be uh, an example of a state hospital? I'm not sure if that's something. Um, I mean, an example of a state hospital. I mean, well, there's a list that Ani, I believe, is a, a client of mine. <laughs> um, there's a list on um, Cal e Procure. We can, you know, look up the state hospitals, but it's like Department of State Hospital. The state of California has a veteran hospital. Those will all be considered, you know, state hospitals. Maybe U at UCSF. Possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure how they're compiling that information for. I think she's asking because they're in the top six. So you know, how do we determine out of that top six which are the state hospitals that are a part of that? But we can look at that specifically and drill down and uh, find out which ones are included in that number. Thanks, Ani. Thanks, Christina. Mark's asking, do you think that it helps or hurts uh, as if we do different types of services? So specifically, I'm referring to performing consultant contract for treasury operations and then one for healthcare. Is it better to just focus on one area of service? You want me to answer? Uh, um, I think it's just, it's not that you have to have one focus, um, but you just don't want to have like 50 different codes that just says you're not really sure what you do. Um, but if you actually have true past performance in both of those areas, 
there's no conflict. You may have separate um, marketing material where you show your past performance with, you know, consulting on treasury oper operations projects, for example, and then you may have another one that focuses on the types of healthcare you've done. So you don't have to focus on one, just don't focus on so many that it looks like you're just a jack of all trades, master of none. Good advice. And I'm gonna skip around a little bit just to spread out the questions. Uh, we're, we are scheduled ending time is about two minutes, but I think it's fine if we go over as long as it's fine with our partners. Um, we don't want to go too far over, but anonymous attendee is asking what support does the SPDC or the PTAC provide in terms of small businesses engaging with the mentor protege program? We provide support in reviewing the mentor protege agreement. So you bring the mentor, or if you're the mentor, you bring the protege and we assist with helping reviewing the agreement and possibly any questions that may go back and forth between you and the SBA and finalizing that. Thank you. Uh, Subarna is asking, thank, she's thanking you first of all, Christina. And then how does a new small business with no sales credentials get into contracting? A new small, um, oh, with no prior experience get into contracting. So yeah, the first thing is, you know, considered a force us looking at who buys what you sell, even though you've not sold to them yet. You know, doing some of the things we talked about during this uh, webinar as far as getting registered, but then also considering who can you subcontract with um, and, and what very small purchases can you pursue that you could get as a, a new contractor that are, are under the threshold, whether it's with the, um, you know, County of Santa Clara or with, with, the, with any agency. There are a lot of small purchases. So depends on what you sell, but Lots of companies start out that way. They don't have uh, sales with government, um, but maybe they have some sales in you know, the private sector, but the government's new. And we talk about you know, what sub subcontracting opportunity they should pursue or what small um, simplified acquisition purchases they should pursue. Those are the best ways to get started. All right, thanks. And we have a question about GSA Schedule 70 uh, specifically looks like. Um, what does the SBD, what does the SBDC or the PTAC do to support for small business in this regard? Oh, sorry. Um, we help again. So NorCal PTAC are all the PTACs are technical assistance, which means that you have to do the work, but we will help you with review. And you know, if you have an, uh, a schedule ready to submit, or we'll help you also with putting together the schedule, meaning not actually physically, but guiding you on what the clauses mean what you need to provide um, here or there. So we walk you through and just kind of being that sounding board to help you understand what's required and also help you determine if you're really ready for it. Because you know sometimes people hear different terms and they're not quite ready for that particular thing. So that would be the first thing I would do is let's review, you know, do you really qualify for this schedule before you go through all this paperwork and then you know, it, it's denied. Thanks, Christina. Uh, we just, I would say we have a time for maybe two or three more questions. So um, let's go ahead and ask this one from Lineth. How do I find out which one of my, which one is my company's appropriate NAICS code? Um, is it just a best guess or is there a specific guideline? I'd like some guidance with this step. Thank you. You can, there'll be a link on the slide. I think two slides before this one. Um, to find your next code. Just put your keyword in, look at the description and see if it's a fit for what you sell. Perfect. Um, and, and just in terms of what's the best next code to be the primary one. Um, that's part of their question. What's the best next code? They're asking singularly if there's, I know you're not supposed to have too many next codes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it depends on, on what you sell, but um, that's more, you know, kind of like an individual question we, you know, take during a session, you know, just depends on what you sell. Um, and next codes are really broad, just know that they're really broad and it may not, you know, that actually what's shown as a title tied to that next code may not be exactly what you sell, but, you know, we can definitely help you flush that out to pick out what's best. All right, thanks. Uh, James has a question here. 
at James, good name. What is the specific requirements for the small business versus micro business? Are there sort of certification requirements for micro businesses? No, um, it's the same requirement. It's just, I can't remember off the top what the threshold is, but you know, businesses under a certain mark are just issued as small uh, micro businesses, but they have the same um, impact. You know, a micro business is a small business, you know, so they're the same. Okay. We have one last question here. Does does a small small business need to be located in the county of Santa Clara in order to do business with it? Cheryl? No, um, we actually, um, for the set aside program for food sourcing, yes. Uh, those small businesses, um, they have to locate it within the county. Um, but we offer so many different opportunities to engage all businesses to do business with the county. So uh, those opportunity will be open to everyone. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I'm gonna cut the Q&A off here. If you had a question that wasn't answered, feel free to email me at info norcalptac.org. The email address is on the screen there. Um, uh, we just ran out of time, but you guys had some really great questions. Thank you so much for being an active audience. Uh, we are going to send out the slides. Uh, they're going to have all these links active on them, so you can click on those. The video recording will also be sent out later today. And when you leave this webinar, and also in that email we're going to send out later, you'll be redirected towards a survey. Um, if, you could really, if you could fill that out, we would really appreciate it, both on the county side as well as the PTAC side. Helps us track how we're doing on our webinars and improve our services. And at least for PTAC, it matters to our funder as well. So pretty pleased you can do it quickly and anonymously. Um, and of course, a huge, huge thanks to the County of Santa Clara. We really um, enjoy participating with you guys on this event and we're looking forward to future events. Uh, can, thanks, Christina, for putting all the work together for this. Quick question. Can you just mention briefly that this is a, a series for the county and the county, can we go back a slide? Um, or maybe I could do that, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah, the next topics in this series um this is specifically for county of santa clara so it won't be general to federal state government you know request for quotation and invitation to bid is the next one that's coming up in may and this will go through you know there will be informal competitive procurement in august and then request for proposals in november 2021 so if you really want to do business with the county of santa clara please uh, join us for these sessions if you ladies have something to add feel free uh, thank you so much. Um, we're so excited to continue our partnership with PTAC and also folks actively involved in those uh, web vendor webinars. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And I appreciate that, um, Christina. All right. And thanks all of you for coming today and hope to see you at future webinars, including the other ones in this series. Thank you. Bye-bye.